our study was focused on Carroll County, um, and we started taking samples in around four years ago now, um, in early 2012. And over our study period, you can see these four panels show the number of fracking wells in this area. So this is our five county study area, and that's Carroll County. I always think it looks like Frankenstein's head or something, doesn't it? It's like a perfect, um, the little bolts on his head. It's the only county in Ohio with ears. Yeah, it's very easy to pick out on a map, except when it's covered in fracking permits. Um, so over our study period, the number of producing wells in red, um, permitted wells, and drilled wells has increased in this area. So this is an example of the valuable aspect of our study is that we were taking samples as more and more wells were drilled so that we could potentially attribute causation. Um, and, oh, sorry, the, these yellow squares actually are our sampling sites, not the, and the red dots are active gas wells. This legend goes with that, sorry, I didn't make this presentation for me. <laughs> um, so you can see we've collected almost, um, I think over 100 sample, or water from over 100 people throughout our study area, many of those people more than one. There's Claire. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> My picture's kind of blurred. This is your house, right? <laughs> oh, that is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so here we are at the kitchen sink taking a sample. So what we measured, we took water samples. You can kind of see them here for analysis of methane concentration and the isotopic fingerprint of methane back in our lab in Cincinnati. And this instrument here is measuring the salt content of water and the acidity of water. Because if you remember, the fracking fluid is really salty and it's very low in pH. So this, these measurements were potentially early warning signs of fracking fluid intrusion. Um, so over our study period, we had 23 wells, many of the people who uh, are in this room are our participants. Um, we sample 23 wells several times a year for three years. And we also did a larger campaign in the five county area in summer of 2013 to get some additional baseline samples. Um, and here's another one of our cute students measuring the pH and conductivity or salinity of the um, water. Um, so, just a little aside, this is what our lab in Cincinnati looks like. These isotopes are, are very complicated to measure. This whole lab contains the one instrument that makes that measurement. And there's Claire um, putting some samples in the instrument to analyze them. So, it's not the kind of thing you can do in the field or from your vehicle. Um, so, this is an example of the um, data sheets we would give to our participants. So many of you may have seen this before. Um, this is just to remind me to tell you that the data that we collected were all made available to our participants and are totally anonymous. So people's names will never be revealed in conjunction with their results. That's not part of our goal. Um, so you can, here are some of our results. So this graph just shows the pH, or the acid content of drinking water, and the salt content of drinking water. And these symbols are color-coded to indicate the distance from the nearest fracking well at the time when the water sample was taken. So the lighter symbols mean the sample was taken very close to a fracking well or within one and the darker symbols are more than 10 kilometers away from the nearest fracking wall. And you can see that all of our samples fall within a range of pH from 9 to about 5, and conductivity from 100 to about 1,200. 
And these are all within the clean water range um, for rivers and groundwater in this area, which is very good news. We didn't find any changes over time either in any of our homes along a time series of fracking activity. Um, and these are um, some of our methane concentration data. So if you remember um, the Pennsylvania study, the dangerous level of methane was about 10 milligrams per liter. And this is just all of our samples categorized by their concentration. So about half of our samples had um, about 1 million times less methane than the danger limit, or 1 microgram per liter. We only had four samples that were above the dangerous level of methane, and the rest fell between these. Okay? So most of our samples were very low in methane, and a few of them were high in methane. And those are the wells that was in this geographic area? Yes. Ohio, not, not, not Pennsylvania? Yeah, these are the data from Carroll County okay. and the surrounding counties, right? Good question. Does that speak to origin as well? Well, that's in the um, upcoming slides, the methane stabilizing Okay. Um, and as I said, with pH and conductivity, we didn't find a change in methane concentration in any of the wells that we measured over a time series. So this is an example of one of our participants wells, and down here you can see the date, so this is um, the beginning of, or the end of 2012, and here's um, the end of 2014, um, and this is a methane and this is in milligrams per liter. The highest we found was much, much less than one milligram per liter. It was actually about 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. So very low it, within the clean water range. And this line indicates when the natural gas well was drilled on that property. And you can see that our highest methane concentration sample was observed before the well was drilled. But most of the samples, both before and after the well were drilled, were very low, were in the low range. And that's consistent with all of the wells that we sampled over a time series. We never saw a significant increase in methane concentration after a fracking well was drilled. Okay, so where did the methane in these wells come from? Was it from a biological source or a natural gas source? So this graph is set up in the same way that the Pennsylvania data set were from, were organized. So this shows the carbon isotopic composition of methane, which indicates whether it's a biological source or a natural gas source. And this is the methane concentration. So in Pennsylvania, the highest samples fell in this area in the elevated concentration and natural gas isotopic composition. But at, just like in Pennsylvania, most of our samples were very low in methane, but unlike Pennsylvania, the samples that we collected that were very high in methane clearly did not have a natural gas source. And this was unexpected for me, a city girl who doesn't have the well water. <laughs> but. Um, it took us a while to figure out what was going on here. So, and some of these samples are in the range that's potentially dangerous. Oh, and um, these are color coded the same way where the darkest symbols are furthest away from the nearest natural gas well. So actually some of our highest observed methane concentrations were not near a fracking well at all. Um, and what we figured out is that the methane, the high methane observed in the water wells in our study was probably derived from coal bed methane, which is generated in the subsurface. So you guys have been learning about the Rose <coughs> coal mine a lot, and you know um, from living in this area that there can be fires in these coal mines, right? So methane is generated in the coal mine through this biological process that I described. It's 
a little bit different than the way natural gas methane is formed. And that's what our isotopic comparisons indicate. So these are our data in blue. Um, in purple are natural gas samples that were um, measured in this area before fracking started. And then, oh, in red are natural gas samples from this area. And the purple are coal bed methane samples. So our data fall within the range of coal bed methane previously observed. And um, now that we thought about it, it made sense because this entire Appalachian area in Ohio has a long history of coal mining and there are subsurface coal seams throughout the area. This is just a geologic map of um, oil, gas, and coal bed methane fields. So actually there's even some commercial extraction of coal bed methane in Harrison County, a little bit. So to confirm that our methane was derived from coal seams and not from um, the same kind of processes that make um, methane in a pond or a landfill or a cow stomach. We did some additional isotopic analysis using radiocarbon dating. So this is the kind of thing you hear about with um, figuring out how old mummies are or things like that. Same kind of technique, you figure out how old is the carbon in that sample. So cows breathe out methane that's very young. It's derived from a plant that was alive probably that day or yesterday. Whereas coal, the carbon <coughs> in coal, is millions of years old in some cases. So coal methane doesn't have any radiocarbon in it. They call that radiocarbon dead. Okay? Does that make sense? And what we found was that most of our samples that were very high in methane had a very low isotopic signature of radiocarbon, indicating that the coal methane was probably our likely source. So this figure shows um, our samples in yellow and um, modern carbon from a wetland up here. Um, coal bed methane down here, and then um, natural gas over here. So you can see for the subset of samples that we analyzed for radiocarbon, they're not in the range observed for natural gas. So um, as I said, we found that there was no significant change in methane concentration over time, even as more and more natural gas wells were drilled in the area. But we did find that some of our participants did have very high levels of methane, and some of them in this dangerous explosive range. Um, but our isotopic analysis indicated it has biological origins, and that probably most of the people with very high methane um, had um, coal bed methane in their well. So How did they get that? Under pressure from the... Uh, uh all the pressure into the, the fracking up through the fissures? No, I, I think because it was there before the fracking happened in, in our case. So we didn't find a relationship with fracking activity and methane levels. Yes? Did you see, did you see any uh, correlation though between the density of the, uh, the oil and gas well that had been drilled over the years down through the, all the coal? Pardon? Have, did you see any uh, reference, though, or as to the density of the coal, oil, and gas wells that have been drilled? You know, you mentioned that there was tens of thousands. Of yes. Them. No, I haven't looked into that, but that's a very good idea. I can take a look at that. I mean, it's very, it's very hard because <clears throat> this area, um, as I said, well, there's some legacy oil operations in northwestern Ohio, but there's hundreds of thousands of oil wells here, many of the locations have been lost over time. So even though, if we look at Carroll County here, this part of Carroll County has a long history of oil extraction, probably over a century ago. 
We asked everyone in our study, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, participants, if they had an old oil well on their property and, and no one knew of one. So there are there, but the locations are not known. And even the state of Ohio doesn't know where they are. It's a big problem. There's, a, uh, there's an awful lot of core borings, too, for yeah. looking for oil and or yeah. coal. There's a lot of coal borings. and. Yeah. To my knowledge, they didn't have a real good protocol or any way of checking to see that right. they had actually sealed those core borings yeah. properly, too. Right. So you, it's just like you got a sieve in this area. Yes, and we, and I think that um, coal bed methane can also be generated even if there's a very small amount of coal in your well bore. So it doesn't have to be the that the your groundwater well goes through a coal mine. It could be just a small seam of coal, um, or even that it's located adjacent to where your well is. As long as it's somewhere 